Hi everybody, so nice to see so many friendly faces and I'm honoured to be speaking to my community of practitioners. Um, this, this talk, there we go, I'm <laughs> shorter than Kirsty and Bill. Um, this talk actually started life as um, a presentation at the National Library earlier this year. It was part of our staff-led professional development sessions focused on kind of all things digital and all things tech. And these sessions really aim to establish a, a kind of comprehensive foundation um, shared across the library of what constitutes digital literacy. Um, it's to allow people to upskill, share knowledge they have, and even get people thinking about the role that emerging tech um, plays in the heritage sector. And I wanted to mention these sessions, um, first of all, to give a shout out to like grassroots staff led professional development, because that has been like A plus, like amazing for me. Um, but also to explain to you why I am the person here giving you this talk. Um, it's kind of self evident why Ting is here as somebody who works with Digital New Zealand. She is deeply qualified to talk about APIs. Um, but I am actually here because, though I'm a little more qualified now, um, at the time I was just straight up not qualified to talk about APIs. Um, the people who ran the professional development sessions wanted to um, run an experiment to see that if someone who knew nothing could learn enough about APIs to explain them coherently to another room full of people who may or may not know heaps. And why did they want to do it like that? Um, well, because APIs are ubiquitous. Whether we know it or not, we're using them pretty much all the time. So I think um, as people and as people who work with tech, we have a vested interest in knowing how they work. But there's also a lot of domain-specific language that is used to explain them. Um, and at least I found there is a lot of confusing language used to explain how they work. And there's also a lot of um, kind of inexactitude about what we're talking about when we're actually talking about APIs. So this session is about bridging that gap between like straight up tech expert and well-informed general user. Um, so that's kind of what's going to happen. I'm going to give you a general introduction, talk about some of the concepts, and then Ting is going to like expand on some things. Um, so what I'm going to do... Um, is I have one caveat, and that is that I learned about this in an almost exclusively web-only um, environment. APIs exist everywhere in software, they're across the board, but when I say API, I mean web API. And I'm going to use the words website and web application relatively um, interchangeably, and when I say that, I would like you to think about Twitter and Instagram and um, Google Maps. So, you know, very common web applications that you can access through a browser, but that have a lot of stuff sitting behind them, you know, stuff that people want to get at, like photos, tweets, um, geo coordinates. Um, and this is just a quick word on how I learned what I learned. Um, this is my YouTube watch history, um, which you can. <laughs> Um, so all I did to learn about this was I watched 50s of minutes of um, YouTube videos, all titled things like, what is an API? And yes, that was on work time. Um, so what is an API? <clears throat> the Wikipedia page says, in computer programming, an application programming interface, API, is a set of subroutine definitions, protocols, and tools for building application software. In general terms, it is a set of clearly defined methods of communication between various software components. That did not help me at all. Um, and it is actually, on the other side of this, that is actually quite a coherent definition. Um, but when I started my journey, uh, that didn't help me at all. So I'm going to talk to you about a few things that actually did. Um, the first helpful thing um, to get me um, learning about this was a comparison. So I came across a suggestion to think about an API in relation to a GUI, a GUI, the graphical user interface, which most of us know um, refers to the way that we as humans interact with computers. So we double click on icons, we drag and drop, we type things into the, um, the browser and it comes up in the Google search bar. So there's a whole bunch of systems and code and um, like things there designed to structure how we interact with computers. So if the term graphical user interface refers to um, the systems that help humans interact with computers, then the term application programming interface just refers to the systems that help computers interact with other computers without a human there, or in our case, web 
applications interact with other web applications. So machines don't need mice, they don't need drag and drop, they don't need um, a browser that you can see, but they need other mechanisms and rules for interacting, and more on that later. Um, the other thing which helped me understand APIs was analogies. The most common one is that an API is a conversation between machines. Um, one video I watched um, suggested thinking about APIs as a messenger that takes requests. And this is a quote. Think of an API as a waiter in a restaurant. Imagine you're sitting at the table with a menu of choices to order from, and the kitchen is the part of the system which will prepare your order. Easy. What's missing is the critical link to communicate your order to the kitchen and deliver your food back to the table. That's where the waiter or the API comes in. End quote. Um, I quite liked that one. I thought that was good because it helped me understand the kind of purpose of an API that it is to like to communicate separate um, communicate between separate parts of a system. But I still, and I don't know if you guys are like me, wanted to know what an API looked like IRL and like how to interact with one. Um, well, you guys, I watched a 56-minute video on <laughs> on how to build an API from scratch and. Spoiler alert, it turns out an API is literally just snippets of code. <laughs> like, snippets of code with a very, very specific purpose. Um, what I learned is that when people say an API, what they're talking about is just the part of the web application or website, that little bit of code that can talk directly to other web applications without human intervention. That's all. So to build an API is to code into your web application the capacity for data to be extracted from it or added to it in a machine-readable format by other websites. So if you know what code looks like in any language, you know what an API looks like. And that's what it looks like when it's at home. So one of the things that I often found quite confusing was the kind of like an API, like the kind of nounization of that word. For me, it really helped when I thought of it more like a service you can provide or a capacity that a web application can or can't have. So when we're saying, does that have an API? What we're saying is, can we take data or can we put data into this website or web application directly from ours? So the API code, so the bit of the website that is the API, sets things out like, this is where other websites need to look for data if they want to extract it from me. This is how I handle a request to extract information. This is how I handle a request to insert information. This is how I expect requests to be stated, and that's an important one. Because if you don't write anything in your code that says, this is how I will handle a request for information, then other machines that make requests meet a brick wall, and they can't automatically extract any of your data, and you have this little silo thing going on. And I think that's where the real, like, so what factor is. So, you know, if you're, you know, building an application that might need geodata, for example, well, you can either, like, create your own huge database of, like, geo coordinates, or you can just plug in to the Google Maps API. Um, so before I hand over to Ting, I just wanted to get very specific on one final point. Um, so from the other side, to access an API, you make an API call. Um, then that's the request, the name of the request. And usually we don't see them because they are embedded in web applications or widgets. Um, they live under the hood. And that's part of their magic. They pass the data around without, without us seeing it. Um, but funnily enough, like a lot of things on the web, they look really like URLs. Um, and this is where Ting comes in. She is going to talk you through creating API calls and teach you how to manipulate one from your web browser. So I'll hand over. Thanks to Flora, now we know that the API is not something super scary from the metrics after all. Uh, it's more like, I like the analogy that uh, it's more like a friendly waiter at our local restaurant and uh, it serves us what we order for a meal. And now it's just stuck in my mind to um, how I see digital NZ works. So we have more than 30 million digital content that's contributed by our wonderful 200 plus content partners. And then we, and now I just see that we have a huge kitchen that is preparing all the digital content and through our API, we're serving them the delicious 
digital content to our v wider variety of uh, consumers that are eating them in different ways, consuming them in different ways. Um, so for accessing an API first, as si since that we're in the theme of keys, um, a key is very important because most of API providers requires the users to have an API key. An API key is a long string of letters and numbers that functions like a password. So it's quite important to keep it safe. And um, I will show you a basic call that I made with my API key, which you will not see it. <laughs> I have hidden it. Um, it. This is from the DJNZ API. And yes, I understand it doesn't look very user-friendly, just like us before our morning coffee. Um, but this is considered very user-friendly for computers. So DJNZ provides three response formats, JSON, XML, and RSS. They're all very friendly to computers. For us high-maintenance humans, one waiter is far from enough, so we need extra servants. Uh, so on our web browser, for our web-based API, we, um, need hand we have handy extensions that we can store. It's called JSON View, or there's, any other, there's many other options as well. So we install that, and boom. It really helps us to see it comfortably with our human eyes, and um, it's just shows clearly, oh, there's um, so many uh, results have returned. And, um, and you can see the first record is from papers past. And to filter the millions of results that have returned here, you can manipulate your API call with parameters. Another difficult term for us humans. Um, so parameters is the information you can add uh, to the end of the URL. And it defines your search. Like, you know, at, to a waiter, you need to give them the waiter information, what do you want, how you like to serve, which is like to be complicated. No problem. So we add extra parameters. And uh, so how do, you, how do you know what kind of parameters you can add? So like a restaurant, you have a menu, and you can, you can order what is available. Most uh, API providers also offer detailed documentations um, uh, to help you to construct your API call. Here's a scary list of some parameters available for the um, Digital Z API. And um, there is even more. So do check it out on our website. And I do understand the API uh, documentations looks a bit daunting, because who likes to read Manuals, I don't. But I learned the hard way. Um, so you, you think as, as the, the restaurant scenario, everybody likes to read manual. Uh, no, sorry, I have my English. It's okay, but you find, you, you want to find food, so you read a manual and think that way, because you want to get something, you want to consume something. And um, it will really help you to understand what an API can offer you. So for Digital NZ API, we have a format to construct the API call. Um, the f I know it looks like, oh my gosh, but in plain English, it basically says the URL to our API, the version of our API, and um, the w uh, which API call from Digital NZ because we offer more than more than one, and uh, the um, format we want to see it to present. And lastly, define what you want to search. And yesterday, I was talking to Sarah about um, like creating a Twitter bot for a dog. Well, I'm a dog person. I mean, sorry, cat. I'm a do I'm dog person. So I want to create an app um, to showcase all the dog images I can find from our API. So I will uh, make it bigger for you to see. So I would. Um, use the um, parameter called text. And then we, I want to have all the dog, dogs, doggies. So I add that little star. I know it's not the right name, but I can't pronounce it. I practiced so many times. But uh, <laughs> yes, and I want to limit it. I, le I want to limit it to uh, the category. As you can see, there is another um, parameter. I want to 
limited to images. And then, um, uh, and, he and here I can, oh, sorry. And then um, this is already being limited to images. Um, and I still feel like it's showing a bit too much information for my brain to sift through. Um, so we can limit the number of fields uh, that's showing from the API, and we can just continue adding more requirements, more parameters at the end of the line, and um, to reduce uh, the the the, many, the number of fields. So like here, I have reduced to only show the um, content partners who uh, contribute most dog images. And this is basically how we do our metadata battles. I don't know if you see some of our Twitters. And we just compete, uh, we compete for you, uh, my, uh, our dear country, uh, content partners. Um, so we just pick the first two content partners that who holds the most content, and we decide the winner. And here is ATL. <laughs> Good on you. Um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, to make our life even easier, there's so many fantastic organizations really do everything to support everyone and anyone who wants to use their API. Two of my favorite API provided by Auckland Museum and Tipapa. And so the uh, Auckland Museum API have completely removed the requirement for an API key. Completely removed it. I was mind blowing. <laughs> um, and uh, for anyone who's interested, you can just go ahead and give it a go. Um, I feel for me, I w I'm not super expert on API, and I feel without the key, it's just more inviting and feels less scary and more comfortable. Um, and um, the the formula from D Z API can quickly translate with, even though it's a different term, um, it is quite easy to read. Um, so this is a basic search I've done from uh, the Auckland Museum's API. I'll search on Sky Tower. This is the only thing I know about Auckland. Sorry, Auckland. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so they, uh, they have a search, and that's the endpoint which you can um, use to perform sophist sophisticated search queries. And then you, after um, you have the uh, name of the search index, that I got search from, and then the underscore search is the operation uh, we want to perform. And again, the the uh, sky tower is now under the queue that is query parameter. So it's quite similar to the Z API. Once you know, you know this the formula is quite similar. Um, and then again, we can. We can add on extra parameters to change the size and then change the pages um, that show from uh, the 20th record. And um, so on the other hand, Tipapa's API, even though it has a key, hint, hint, maybe we can remove that as well, um, <laughs> uh, have solved one of my biggest fear, I don't know if other people, is, is I'm a very visual person. So, so the, the Tipapa's API browser has kind of transitioned from um, just the API to the GUI field. Mm -hmm. And uh, it really made me feel even more comfortable. And uh, so instead of you have to learn and type every parameters out, it is, boom, you can just drop uh, the <laughs> What is it called? The uh, drop-down menu, and then select them, and all the um, the, the, the complete API call will be constructed in front of your eyes. Oh my gosh! Um, so this is all learning curve for us, and I believe there is going to be more wonderful things like Tipapa and Auckland Museums doing. Uh, hand handy joins their team, uh, so we need to make it better. Um, so just. Remember that we were once you not long ago, and uh, you're definitely not alone. If you're confused um, and so worried about this, we can learn it together. That's all. Should I stay here?
Thank you so yes. much. Does anyone have any questions for Tang and Flora? Any questions? No questions, good. I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> I really want to make this Twitter but Yeah. Um, so what, what would your advice be to someone that wants to use, doesn't know anything about APIs, but wants to make something? Read the documents. <laughs> Read the documents. Okay. And um, just give it a go. Uh, sorry, should I stand? Yeah. Just give it a go and construct your um, API core and see what you get. Um, and I don't know, you, so you wanted to create a Twitter bot? A competing one against yours. Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> I, I, have, I have not started mine. I have not started mine. And uh, that will be my new project as well. Okay. Yes. Well, um, yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Any other questions? Wait for the microphone, sorry. It's coming. Shout out. <laughs> Hello, hate microphones. Um, how do you actually get hold of an API? So it's like, oh, I want to go and get an API. As soon as I leave this room, how do you do that? Sorry, I, I missed what you said. If I wanted to leave this room now and get a hold of an API, how would yeah. I do that? Well, the um, Auckland Museums one, you can just search API Auckland Museums and you will just be able to start using it. And for DigitalNZ, um, you can go to our website and register for, uh, for API key. Um, Tipapa, uh, I'm not too sure at the moment, we got private key. Um, yes, <laughs> I'm sure Tipapa will give you a key if you want one. So through a web browser then? Yes. Okay, Yes. Cool. Um, yeah, if there's one thing that you should take away from this talk, it's that you can learn anything from a YouTube video. Um, <laughs> like, because there was one that I watched which was, um, which was really incredible, which actually just talked you through in about nine minutes what it was to build a small um, web application which took um, uh, photos from... Uh, no, it, you searched something you searched a place and then it would return all of the photos from Instagram which had been taken at that location. So what it did is it took your tiny little input, it took, went to the Google Maps API, geocoded it, sent that to in Instagram and then returned the photo. So like this is a really short video and the guy built this whole like whole app in front of you. And what that did was also went through the kind of attendance skills which you might need to embed an API call in a really, really small website. Um, and then I discovered that yeah, you can just like go to Digital New Zealand, get an API key and then you start building these calls in your web browser and then you can see it happening in front of you and it's like I mean it's incredibly empowering I was just like wow look at me go like getting all of the records from Auckland Museum da, 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 da. like yeah, it was great thank you any other questions not a question but more of a statement um, those web applications and everything it requires scripting and that's the bit that I yes. hate. And um, it's, if you can find the script there and you just need can adapt it, it's like a, the way to go if you're not too big on scripting. Yeah. Um, and, and choosing the one you want, the right script. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, like, as I said, the attendance skills can be another barrier to be able to like, engage with this stuff. But yeah, maybe a Google search with a, will find somebody who's done the work for you with that script, yeah. Um, hi, that um, YouTube clip sounded really good and knowing how hard it is to find things on YouTube, could you share via Twitter the link to the sure. YouTube clip you talked yeah, about? Yeah, Thanks. yeah. And ho hopefully my ringing endorsement of that YouTube video won't be <laughs> misguided. Oh, she can say it. We can repeat it, maybe. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering if there was much compatibility between the different APIs. I mean, they look quite different from what you've shown us. So if you're doing a search on one API and then you want to perform it on, say, you're doing it onto Puppers and then you want to perform it on Auckland Museums, are you having to learn a whole different set of rules or is there some kind of level of compatibility between them? <laughs> 
I, I unfortunately I feel like it's more or less um, it is different for some of them yeah so again go back to the document you really have to look through the document I really learned the hard way I really did <laughs> first I was I was very, I was very comfortable with the and API and, and then I wanted to um, just explore more on the Auckland Museum one and I was like oh they're different so I like, oh, read documents Yes, I just constantly have to remind myself to read the documents and to find out what actually is on offer. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, like, they're kind of the same but different. Mm. Like, you have, like, this, you have the beginning structure, which is, like, the little address where the API actually lives and you're talking to it, and then there'll be um, kind of a symbol which means this is where your query starts, and then you, like, you can put in the different parameters for what you're looking for, but they'll... So there's the kind of, yeah, similar structure, but, yeah, different flavours, and as Ting says, read the documents. Yeah, because they're really helpful. Any more questions at all? Well, thank you once again. That was really <laughs>